everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Liraz, Customer Success Manager at Site, and welcome to our webinar on how to leverage AI for assortment planning and buying. Today, I'm joined by Nikaila Vessels, CEO of one of our favorite partners, Style Arcade, and Avi Zook, Site's VP of Customer Success. So a quick background on our speakers just before we get started. Uh, Mikaela Vessels joins us from New York City, where she is the CEO and co-founder of Style Arcade. She has over 20 years of retail experience in merchandising, buying, planning, and consulting, having worked with retailers across South Africa, Australia, and the UK before launching Style Arcade in 2018. Style Arcade is an AI-powered merchandise buying and planning platform, which is used by some of the world's largest fashion brands and retailers. On a daily basis, thousands of global users, including buyers, planners, marketers, and e-commerce managers use Style Arcade for all of their product decisions. It helps them know exactly how much to buy so that they hit their sales targets, but without all the unnecessary inventory from over-ordering. They work with pure, pure play e-commerce giants like the iconic Princess Polly and White Fox, all the way to cult designers like LMA, Christopher Esber, and The Only. So thank you again, Michaela, for joining us today. And now, thank you. Um, and now moving on to Avi Zook, VP Customer Success here at Sites. Avi has over 10 years of experience working with companies of all sizes and managing, managing CS and consulting teams at SaaS companies in the fields of e-commerce, data analytics, and machine learning. Um, in the last three years at Site, he's leading customer success globally and working with our customer success team and our, our enterprise and medium-sized companies. So thank you, Avi, as well. Hey, Lira, thank you. Uh, lastly, just a few words about Site. Uh, so Site is a product discovery platform centered around visual and generative AI for e-commerce. Site's mission is really to help e-commerce companies to connect their customers with their products they were looking for. We do this by creating intuitive search and discovery experiences through a variety of visual search, product recommendation strategies, and of course, AI tagging. So I think now we can get right into things. Um, so on today's webinar, we'll start by looking at some of the main challenges buyers and merchandisers are facing during the retail planning season. And then we'll explore how AI and some other emerging technologies can really level up assortment planning. And don't worry, we'll also have some time for Q&A at the end. So totally feel free to drop your questions in the chat and we'll make sure to address them later on. Um, so let's start by discussing the challenges. Uh, Michaela, what did you find as the biggest challenge facing buyers and merchandisers at this time of year? So thanks, Liraz. Um, I guess because I was a buyer and merchandiser in my previous life, um, I feel like there's no time of year that's not challenging, no kidding. So, you know, I think for us, the the biggest thing is all year round, you're trading three time periods at once, right? You're trading current season, you're analyzing the just previous season, and you're planning the future season. So your brain is always in three time zones at once. Uh, and that was definitely challenging. So um, it's the complexity of managing all of that simultaneously is certainly a thing. And then if we look at, you know, when you buy a particular product, just for one single product, you have so many decisions. I'd say hundreds of decisions to make about that product. What are you going to price it at? You know, what are you going to buy? How many units? Locations you'll send it to, size splits, margin targets, the list goes on, and those are the obviously the very high level ones, but you always want to balance that assortment, right? So wherever you are in the globe, you want to make sure that you're sending the right seasonality product to the right place, that you are optimizing the right category mix for the different consumers. Um, never mind color, price band, silhouette, the list goes on. And for us, I guess the biggest challenge was the level of data that you could plan at, you could never get to because you're using BI tools, spreadsheets, and pivot tables. That's mm -hmm. all we had. And so I guess the, the biggest challenge for, for us as buyers and planners was how do you buy the right product 
at the right level of data integrity as well and not be overstocked and not also leave revenue on the table because our best sellers used to sell out so fast. So I guess my my two biggest things for you know what we struggle with as buyers and planners is those two things. If we could solve two problems in retail, you know, um, let's solve that that issue of leaving revenue on the table and obviously um, excess inventory would be great. But I remember looking at this, you know, global situation of like sending product to all these different consumers. One of the CEOs that I worked with, he came into the office one day and said to the merge team, guys, I was just in Oxford Street and the store looks like a complete fruit salad. And mm -hmm. whilst it was like funny inside, it really hurt because we work hours to get those plans perfect. And the products are just changing dates and attributes. And, you know, we're switching this fabric for that fabric. And by the time you get to delivery, you don't know what's going on at that point. So um, I think for us, it was the sheer volume of data, wanting to get it perfect and just not having the tools to do it. Uh, so in my opinion, AI should be solving a lot of this heavy lifting for us. But as you guys will know, it's so controversial, right? There's opinions about whether AI is either like on a scale of zero to 10, zero completely hype and not useful for my day to day or 10, I love it and it's deeply valuable and it's changing my role. But I think most people sit smack bang in the middle of a five to say, yeah, I, I don't know, show me. If you can make it practical, if you can make it auditable so that it's not this black box, I might buy into this and I might start to listen about what AI can help me with in future. So to move people from a five to a 10, we really need to make it more approachable, practical, auditable. And I think that's absolutely, you know, the biggest goal. And I'm excited to see how AI can help us with not leaving revenue on the table and not overbuying. So, yeah. Michaela, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense uh, to me. From our side, most of the time we are dealing with kind of the current season and the current state um, at the front end of e-commerce um, and you know one of our solutions is really kind of uh, offering alternative products to items out of stock or out of stock in my specific size and we do see customers that are coming into the website and really kind of clicking on uh, show me that alternative or out of size and some of them will continue the journey uh, but we're still seeing such a large amount of drop-off and I think that you know, on the one hand, you do want to deal with that um, on the front end, but also, is that not a bit too late? And do you want to make sure that you're dealing with that throughout the whole kind of life cycle? Um, a lot of our customers went into kind of 2023 uh, with a lot of challenges on supply chain. And I think that, you know, the sales seasons have been so great. So, so buying the right items at the right times, um, especially moving into sales seasons or coming out of sales seasons is so crucial in that sense. Um, from the challenges side, I do want to add, I think from our side, what we're seeing is the biggest challenge is how do we test for value? You were talking about that kind of scale of zero to 10, um, but, but really kind of how much added revenue this is making me mm. um, on the one hand. And on the other hand, how much cost or time is the saving? And, and I think that that's where kind of AI needs to be measured across these two kind of main scales in that sense. Yeah, that's a good call, Avi. Like, um, show me the money, right? That's yeah. what we want to know. Yeah. You know, Avi, talking about, you know, the challenge in 2023, I think retailers are looking for both of these things, actually. Um, so what are some of the lessons learned that we have from 2023 and the holiday season? So I have to say going into 23, we've had kind of a very weird year, um, financially and economically global, in a global state. And it's been very interesting to us to really kind of analyze the sales season um, and also kind of recently Valentine's Day everything around that. Um, we do see that uh, customers did end up buying a lot more than expected. Conversion rate was going up as well. 
Um, and, then, and then on the other hand, we did look at average order value um, and, and we saw that it slightly decreased. I think that that comes also a lot from a level of uh, heavier discounting mainly um, due to the fact that we can really kind of um, look at how 2023 has performed and understand what are our customers going to look for. for I mean, this is, I love this slide actually when I saw it. Um, it's so impactful because we're excited that we had, you know, better conversion, et cetera, but you say it might be discount driven, which potentially it is. And, you know, some brands, this event is like 10 plus percent of their annual revenue. It's so big. So planning exactly what inventory to have available at this time is, it's a real process. We did, you know, talking about like, where is the ROI or the impact? We did an analysis because a lot of brands want to know how much could I have sold in this event had I been in stock of my best sellers? Because those best sellers just fly out. So we did one analysis with a multi-branded retailer. So they stock Nike, Adidas, they stock uh, Vans, a lot of lifestyle brands. And we found that they had a 5X opportunity just in those four days had they maintained sizes and inventory levels of their best sellers. Imagine doing five times more revenue in Black Friday, Cyber Monday, just by planning it better. It's huge. That, that's crazy. That's really kind of massive. Um, and, and yeah, and, and really kind of looking deeper into the data there on uh, Black Friday, we saw some really interesting insights using kind of our uh, AI tagging capabilities. So we really try to look at not only what's been selling or what are the different tags um, and the different attributes that have been selling by our ability to consolidate all of these attributes and, and detect them from the visual and from the image itself. Um, what we saw is, you know, comfort and casual is something that's here to stay. Uh, I think it started, it, it's kind of a trend that's been going on for a few years. Um, but the main tags that were really been selling out, uh, especially around fashion, are sporty, casual, cotton, natural. Um, and, and consumers were really kind of looking for that rather than something that's a bit more kind of dressy or work related. Uh, black is something that's really kind of dominated fashion. We saw that across 2023 in general um, and, and definitely on sales season, followed by white and red colors. Uh, in the jewelry side, we actually were looking kind of at what types of cuts um, and, and what types of jewelry were sold. And customers were really interested this year in round cut diamonds. I know they're a bit pricier, um, but, but I think that that's something that really kind of is serving that demand. And on the home decor side, sales season really kind of focused on either comfort or gift shopping. So smaller items such as beddings, throw pillows, uh, rugs and mirrors were really kind of dominant. Yeah. It's so interesting, Avi, as a consumer, because we all buy product, obviously, like none of this is surprising because we can all relate to what we've been doing in our consumer patterns. Um, interesting, you know, the jewelry one. I don't know what that is. Obviously, I'm not in the market to buy diamonds, but maybe it's more of like a, it has more longevity. It won't date as quickly. I want something classic. So that investment item that will last you longer, because that's definitely been a trend for people. Exactly. Um, but that home decor is, oh yeah, what do you want to say? Yeah, I, I tend to agree, but I, and I also think that it's kind of a trend that uh, jewelry tends to be very kind of hyped towards uh, towards sales season. So, you know, who's who's in the end going to be the one buying? It's probably kind of a gifting um, area. So I think that, you know, the more we look into it and the more we read and round cut and those types of kind of more special jewelry tend to come up more in our searches. Yeah, super interesting. And the home decor makes total sense. Specifically, everyone's purchasing lower price pointed items, it looks like. Those like feel good things that you in difficult climates just want to load on. I think home and beauty are two of those categories that are just recession proof. Um, you'll always see people gravitating towards those feel good things, like I said. But um, that red you know, with what we see in um, the data is that different colors have different, you know, peaks and troughs throughout the year, red being one of them. And it's having a moment for sure. 
which I'd like to dive into actually and show you guys a couple of things on that space. Cool. So this is actually a slide that where we look at deep tagging from site powered by you guys, mm -hmm. joining that with data analytics from Style Arcade. This is, you know, connecting your ERP data, your ecom data, your PIM, your PLM, anywhere where you can find product information and bringing that together with deep tags. Um, enabling that attribution, right? So a lot of fashion teams, um, Avi, I don't know if you know, but a lot of fashion teams are actually manually doing this. If they don't have sight, they're like tagging the color. They're also tagging the sleeve length, the leg length, all of those things, trying to get better analysis on what's happening and what's performing. So mm -hmm. having this available and automated is so huge for reporting, analysis, planning, um, and then how you join that with your performance data. So, you know, you were talking about red. Larez, if you can flick to the next slide, I'll show you guys just a little bit about um, how red as a trend can perform. And when you join these things, how powerful um, it can actually become. So in this situation, I just did a little filter in Style Arcade to have a look. If you look at the top left, AI color red powered by site. Location all. So let me look at all my locations. And then let me look at the last four weeks worth of data. So how is red performing in my business for the last four weeks? And then on the right, you can see there's this true rate of sale metric, which tells me that when I'm in stock of all my sizes, I can sell 96 units a week uh, of all of this red product. But of course, we never stay in stock of all the sizes. Um, so when it's fragmenting, and it has in the last four weeks, that little black box below, you can see that I can sell 77 units, or I have been selling 77 units, but my true potential is 96 units a week. Um, so quantifying that revenue gap of like, what could I have sold had I just been in stock of my best sellers can be really powerful for future assortment planning, budgeting, et cetera. Like it's a really... Um, insightful thing to be able to see, which you can't do without automated tagging, which is why our customers are so excited about site partnership, obviously. Yeah, and what I really love here is, you know, you can do this with red or you can do that with any color, but you can even go deeper. I mean, you can go as granular as, you know, show me floral summer dresses or v-neck short sleeve t-shirts, for example. Um, so, so everything that you can see visually, you can extract those tags. And once you're creating those kind of um, same uh, dictionary around and across your whole business, you can actually kind of analyze both what's selling out and what's selling in. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point, actually. This goes as deep as site tagging can go, which is pretty deep. So you're right. You can see short sleeve v-neck t-shirts um, you can also go to geolocation show me how short sleeve v-neck t-shirts perform for my la stores because this matters it will sell very differently there to what it will on the east coast for example so um, yeah one of the really interesting things i saw more recently i've only lived in new york nine months but <laughs> One of the brands kind of in Style Arcade pulled up all their best sellers for the state of New York and all their stores. And then they pulled up their best sellers for Michigan State. Mm -hmm. I was amazed at how different these customer preferences are. It's a completely different consumer, you know, in the same country. It's uh, it's wild. So, yeah, customers want different things and their, um, their demands are <laughs> difficult to keep up with. We see the same the same thing kind of with uh, with weather, right? If you're looking at uh, New York and Miami, and then how are you adjusting like your product recommendations even online, um, either through email or through um, just the experience on the website to the customer that's sitting in New York or sitting in Miami. Um, and one of the examples we always had in from Europe is um, German in Germany customers will usually kind of buy full price items. Whereas in Italy, they're like really kind of bargain shops. Oh, so, interesting. So that's another note where you you really need to factor in kind of that geolocation when you're thinking both about planning and about kind of yeah, what. Yeah, so true. And what you're marketing to these Italian customers because where you acquire customers, obviously acquiring a full price customer or a markdown yeah. customer makes a big difference in the long term. 
that's very cool very cool um and um yeah i was actually thinking about marketing products avi as well because when you can have the ability to target certain customers in certain areas with your marketing or email marketing that's really powerful for conversion um and you know what i like one of the kind of tips or tricks i got on site was you guys can do an email and i have never seen this before but you can mm -hmm. do an email so say you send a product feed of all my best sellers in the state of new york to all the new yorkers you can attach it to the stock level at the time the person opens the email that was so cool so you're basically never showing them something they can't convert on which i just loved exactly exactly and, and that's one of the areas we really kind of try to focus on right you want to show the right recommendation in real time in real time yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah so i want to take back the conversation a bit more about trends so Michaela, if we already have the data on trends, how we can really apply this to future assortment strategies? Yeah, Lira, it's a great question. Like I said, these teams, they're operating in all these different past, present, future, all at the same time. So you want to be able to take current trends and trade and translate that very quickly into decisions about your future range. So here on screen, it's an example of what your future range, all of your purchase orders are coming in here. And you can use deep tagging as well to understand, you know, what's my level of investment in red here, for example, um, in the month of May. So I actually can see how much inventory is coming in in red. Um, can I sustain the sales patterns that I'm seeing now from the trend of red? Um, but also to plan all of the facets here. So Avi, you were talking about seeing different colorways, what do my sleeve lengths all look like? So keep filtering and seeing what these assortments look like at all levels. And if you can see at the top there as well, you can sort this on or filter by what is a certain country assortment look like, a grade or what channels, um, all the geolocation stuff that you can see. So you're looking at a huge amount of attribution and geolocation preferences and making sure that your particular store looks great and not like a fruit salad like I was explaining earlier um what is it what is it actually going to land and look like which really helps those marketers as well we're often chasing like you know what's what's going to land in store when have you messed up my campaign because you moved the delivery date out so yeah it's um all teams are in here trying to figure out what's happening with that product assortment how it's moving over time and do you feel that merchandising and planning is underrepresented when it comes to retail tech innovation? I mean, where do you see the most pressing need for new tools and solutions? Liraz, I'm totally biased in this question. Like I was a merchandise planner um, and buyer. So for sure, I felt like we were underrepresented with technology. Like there were so many tools on the front end to help the consumer get the product that we had assorted for them right and there's loads of stuff there on the front end but on the back end when we only have bi tools excel and pivot tables to use to assort it's like how good can you really be like i was i was pretty frustrated with it i'll be honest but mm -hmm. um i think it's such a laborious intense process and can be done so well if given the right tools that leaning on AI, I wish I was a buyer and planner today. Like we didn't have these cool things. Um, and if you want to solve, you know, our biggest problems, which is like, let's not leave money on the table from our best sellers and let's not have excess inventory. Um, let's solve that problem at the source is how I feel about it. Like, let's go to the back end. Let's enable those teams with the tools so that ultimately who's benefiting customer at the end of the day. So, Yeah. Yeah, I very much agree. And I know on the front end side, it's always been about AI and it's always been about product recommendations and, and how are we ranking the, the assortments and, and everything that our customers are seeing. Um, but really kind of the ability to, first of all, unify that taxonomy with the front end because you're looking at search trends and you're looking at um, what is actually selling out. But it's very hard to create this kind of combination between, you know, what am I seeing either on the front end of, of my website, in my term system, in my ERP, um, and how do we kind of really kind of unify that taxonomy 
um, to analyze those trends and understand, okay, so from clicks to sale out to buying trends and to um, product recommendations to, to really kind of look at the whole scope and understand not only where's my opportunity, uh, but what are the alternatives I can surface and how should I plan better next? It's so cool, Avi, because, you know, up until recently, all of this data was in silos, front end versus back end, trying to combine this customer product front end, back end thing, like having all that data in one place. Um, exactly. Yeah. And today, if you're saying crop tops are selling fast, I want to make sure I'm aligning demand on the one hand, but I also want to make sure I'm pushing crop tops as like, you know, collections on my front page on the other hand. Totally. You're into crop tops, Avi? You're going to get yourself one for the same? I might. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I've been thinking about it, especially now that it's heating up. Diamonds and crop tops. Do it. <laughs> I think that we can move forward from challenges and start discussing some solutions. Uh, so I think that by now, we can all agree that AI has obviously had quite a year uh, with many real-life applications. So what other technologies have you noticed really delivering on expectations over the past year in retail? So that's a great question. Um, I know, you know, coming from the world of AI and, and inside, we've kind of been doing generative AI before generative AI was a word. Um, we are in the era of AI and Gen AI has really kind of paved the way into really starting to look at real life applications of how can AI change my life. And we're seeing that not only on the technology side and the B2B side, but we see it also on the customers. Um, so the way I'm seeing it, you know, we're seeing new items like uh, new styling solutions, digital threading rooms, image enhancement, um, to even kind of creating, uh, you know, generative AI models um, to an extent. Uh, what I'm really expecting to see is uh, what will actually kind of catch the customer's eye and what will actually drive revenue. You know, ChatGPT revolution is kind of changing the way the customers are looking for things. Uh, today, you know, in the end, if once I used to look for kind of a short sleeve dress, today I'm going to be looking, or tomorrow I will be looking for um, a dress I can wear for a wedding in summer in Italy. Italy's coming up. Yeah, so true. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, the big challenge that we're seeing right now is how are we moving from all of these really kind of cool uh, and great looking solutions to really kind of tangible revenue impact or to cost saving? Um, and, and what is actually kind of pushing the needle in the end? Because we're going to be seeing customers and, you know, retailers trying on many different types of solutions. But in the end, if it's not going to push the needle on the revenue wise, it's not going to be kind of the one that sticks around. Yeah, I mean, it has to be quantifiable. I'm glad you're pushing that agenda. I agree. Yeah. Um, but what I was thinking, you know, when we were considering um, partnering with uh, Site, two of the things that really stuck out to me as super, super important were one, like, who can I find as the best provider in this space? But secondly, how much innovation is going to come along with the roadmap? alongside us so yeah I um I like that you're trying to make it quantifiable and I'm also pretty excited at a few of the things that you guys have got boiling um over there on the roadmap yeah we're doing a lot of things and that's exactly where you know you try to tread like we want to make sure that every step that we're uh taking is happening together with our customers and making real impact some of the the more interesting areas we're looking at is first of all looking leveraging generative AI and our AI tags um, to automatically generate titles and descriptions from images alone. So you know one of the things that we can really um, differentiate ourselves is only take by the image, understand what are the different attributes, what am I actually looking at, and then from there use generative AI and set, set the tone of voice set you know, how long do I want my top and description, um, and even kind of map the lexicon to end the dictionary to my lingo to actually kind of create those different titles and descriptions. Uh, the other side we're looking at is really kind of getting deeper into styling today. You know, it's, it, on, on the one hand, a lot of our customers are using shop the look solutions, 
Uh, but, but that's for on-body images. But what happens when you have your different images that are either kind of you know, higher velocity and it's harder to get these on bodies, um, or these on bodies are selling out. So, so you know, I do have the shirt in, in place, but I don't have the pants. Um, and that's where we can start kind of thinking about the styles and how do we mimic like styling in, in the most live way possible. Um, and the last piece we're looking at is really kind of smart collections. Uh, so, so, so really leveraging styles, occasions, trends in order to build better recommendations, mainly looking at increasing basket size because we know uh, cost of acquisition has gone up so much in 2022 and 2023. And so much of the focus is how do we make the most of the customers that are enter entering the website? And Michele, you were talking about emails. Um, also returning customers, of course. Um, yeah. so, so those are some of the three that we're really looking at with really the vision to serve um, this kind of full search AI uh, capability to help our customers as they evolve into kind of much more sophisticated search. I love it because it's some of the like really grindy work to so do this manually is a real grind for the team. So I really love that. Exactly. And there you can quantify the cost set. Yeah, true, true. I'd like us to try maybe and connect between specific solutions and specific personas. So I will ask which specific roles are seeing the most benefit from AI for specifically for assortment planning? Oh, uh, Liraz, I think like persona wise, so many people touch assortment planning, you know, in throughout the year, the buying team, the planning team, the marketers, the e-commerce guys, the designers, production, all the way through to like customer service. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but a number of our brands are using site for their customer service search similar um, to recommend when a customer calls in to ask for, you know, a particular product. They can not only say, well, it's out of stock in these, I can recommend these that are in your size. They can also say, oh, actually, the ones that you want are coming in in XYZ date. So they can really see a whole lot more data than before, which is exciting. Um, but yeah, as we as we get these kind of faster and smarter tools, who's going to benefit the most is the customer, right? So if we get AI-powered buying and planning to help model and forecast um, for us, I think it'll really take a lot of heavy lifting off the team. So here is an example. Say I'm buying a new combat boot, a uh, new Chelsea boot. I search similar. I pick all of the site gives me all of those similar products. And then I can see on the right that when I'm in stock of Chelsea boots during this time frame, I can sell 22 units a week. It's my mm -hmm. true um, kind of revenue potential taking into account all of those out of stocks and removing that data. So it's your pure um, sales potential. And then you decide how long that style should live. Here I pick six weeks. And then I decide between high average and low volume. And how I do that is if it's super commercial, it's going to sell truckloads of units. I'll pick the high volume. And what it'll do is it'll model it on all the best high volume performers in that selection. So I don't have to do all of that work. Mm -hmm. And then obviously average or low volume, depending on whether it's a very fashionable item and won't sell um, to high volume. So it'll recommend say 134 units, but the key here is also split the size ratio because I don't want to have to do that in Excel. And so moving on to sizing, I can then use um, AI to pull together, like what are my size ratios? Um, so I can do it for the Chelsea boot. I can also do it here for, an example, I picked um, AI occasion, so day to night dresses. I picked mid length, you can see at the top there, and I picked fabric type silk. So it gave me three options. And then I look at how the size ratio in the dotted line is how I bought it. And the green line is how it's selling. And it can be so different to how I thought it should be planned. So here's where when that automatically is placed for you or suggested you don't have to go and think like do all those calculations in excel and, and pivot tables you can actually just get the recommendation straight from where is the demand by size for each of these products and then the delta is basically the opportunity cost 
Yeah. So Avi, you know what? We um what we see is that brands can lose up to 23% of profit per month on just sizing inaccuracies because this is so hard to get to. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you just get it recommended, you can lap up all of that extra revenue, which obviously we're all after. So yeah. Cool. Can you maybe please share some more examples of the actual impact? There was the best one I've seen. I'll share with you on the next slide. I did um, just having a look. This is top line trade for a particular brand. They sell quite a lot of high volume. So this um, certain time frame, you know, you can see that revenue slightly down. That's not ideal. Stock units slightly up, oh, and also cover. You know, seventeen weeks of inventory will last me seventeen weeks. So that's not ideal either. I kind of want to be a little bit leaner than that. So looking at this, I go, where are the opportunities in the range, right? How do I make more revenue? How do I get revenue back up to where it should be? Because I'm down on last year. So I searched um, supply and demand for uh, department. And here I'm looking at apparel, footwear and accessories. Pretty much how I bought it is how it's trading. So there's not much opportunity, a little bit in footwear, right? Where the sales are exceeding the inventory supply. So you go, okay, there's an opportunity in footwear. It's not really going to do much. And then I looked, okay, let's look a little bit deeper category. Then I can see tops. It's on the same kind of performance as I invested it in. Dresses, I kind of overbought. So that's not ideal. So I probably need to go and discount or do something over there. But this is what most teams have access to, Liraz, on a daily basis. We'll look at things like this. But if you want to go deeper, there is gold underneath this. So I went deeper on attribution through sites. And I looked at AI color family, because remember this is hard to attribute manually, it's effort. So some brands don't even have it. And I saw, okay, wait, white is like really overperforming. I was like, great, so what, what is this white stuff that I need to buy more of? Then I looked at um, the AI subcategory and I go, oh my gosh, wait, we could have had three times the volume of crop tops to what we currently do based on trade. That's huge. Who's buying all of these white crop tops? Maybe it's you, Abby, but this is, <laughs> this is you. Um, but it, the demand was high. And then I go, okay, so if I'm going to buy more white crop tops right away, what price points do I need to range it in? It was super clear. 80 to $100 is overperforming. And this was a six-figure opportunity for this brand. Six figures. That is so major. And I would not have seen this if I didn't have AI assisting me with it. So it was pretty cool. Um, we were really excited about that result. Wow, no, that's really amazing. Um, so taking this into account and also looking ahead, you know, into 2024 and what's next, which key technologies in the market are you looking into? Oh, Avi, you tell us, you tell us. Hmm, of course. Um, so I have to say, starting with really kind of Gen AI is here to stay. Um, I think that uh, one of the bigger challenges there, and, and this is one of the examples that we're doing with the product uh, and description generator. So basically, on the one hand, we can really kind of extract the different tags. And once you have all these tags, so you can say, like, you know, I have the maxi dress, it's light green, um, and, and all of the different kind of types of attributes I can extract. Um, what is the length, what type of wrap, and things like that. Uh, we can really kind of start generating these titles and descriptions. Um, so, so that's number one. But on the other side, you know, it's always kind of a balance between um, how automated you can go with AI versus um, how much you're actually alleviating the manual work. And I think that's what we're going to see a lot in 2024. You know, everyone trying to find that balance uh, because... Michaela, you were talking about the black box um, and opening up that black box. Um, and, and you know, it, it's very hard to kind of put your complete faith and trust into that. So really looking at um, not only can I generate this title and description, but what additional control um, I can get over that and how can I save changes directly into my fund system. So I'm probably going to still be reviewing those titles and reviewing those descriptions because it's still a piece of content I'm going to be putting on my website. Um, but but I want to kind of find that sweet spot where this is alleviating just the right amount of things. Um, other than that, 
So I'm really kind of looking at styling and I'm looking at personalization, um, mainly because of, um, on the one hand, AI, of course, but also the basket size push. And I think that one of the challenges that we're seeing there is everyone's trying to find what are the new ideas or what are the product recommendations I can, I can you know, I always talk about the last uh, IO at IKEA where you go in, you're looking for a couch, you don't end up buying a couch, but then you end up buying a sofa for $200 and you don't even know what you bought. Um, so, so how do we create that kind of, you know, um, increasing bucket size experience online? And I think that the ones that will win there is not only reducing manual effort, but like we said, um, in the end, I want to show this is improving conversion rate and this is really increasing bucket size and not just another cool kind of styling or shop the look solution yeah it's great though for range planning avi and getting that like automation throughout that assortment process when stuff is just done for you and you're checking and editing a little bit oh what a dream <clears throat> exactly um and, and, and excited then for, to put this in exactly and also it leaves you kind of focusing on what's important right you can really kind of put away kind of the mundane the mundane side then start like thinking about you know what are the items are you want to pin to the top or you know what are the different changes i do want to make to set a bit more kind of my um uh, my language but you don't have to do everything from scratch and that's where 100 percent. like yeah. these teams are so talented and you know they're having to do so much grind work when you really just want to be strategic and that's what's that's what this is automation is bringing back for us which is cool exactly so, Avi, in what ways uh, AI tagging can really support a business? So, in that sense, I think we've talked about it a lot, uh, Michaela, uh, even, even kind of prepping to this webinar. Um, when you're, on the one hand, really kind of looking at the back end, and on the other hand, you're looking at the selling side uh, and, and the front end. Um, and the one thing, and, and that's kind of what I put here at the bottom, unifying the lexicon. Um, to really kind of see a holistic experience of the buy-in and the sell-out. So if you're looking at the front end from my point of view, you're really kind of able to surface the right trends as product recommendations. Um, so leopard skin is not something I would normally tag, right? So, and, and, or, or not necessarily tag manually. Um, looking at summer style or looking at specific kind of items that I would like to, um, from, from even like Venix is something that, you know, when I have, a massive amount of items, um, or even if I'm a marketplace and you know all the items that I'm getting in is, are really kind of tagged differently, unifying that taxonomy will help me put that on the front end. Um, it will help me enhance search, um, and of course expand the filters and promote the use of filters. Um, so so you know things are uh, getting a bit more interesting when you move from like show me this in blue and large, right? Um, yeah. And the last piece, of course, is SEO. Like we said, I mean, that that's kind of the holy grail of attracting new customers today. Yeah, totally. I'm with you on unifying that lexicon. I mean, you don't want to be reporting on leopard skin and separately leopard print. It's important to have these all in one. What's the demand for leopard in general? But um, yeah, quantifying those opportunities for me would be one of the big ones as well. Let's put a dollar number to like, what are these? Um, demand versus supply differences. Yeah, I completely agree. And and like we said, it's it's automating so much of the manual work. Um, so if it's the tagging on the back end, if it's the reporting, um, and, and like you showed, Michaela, the the analysis and, and the sheer kind of value you can extract from that, um, rather than kind of dealing with so many spreadsheets, just having this. Um, understanding of this is my opportunity cost and really being able to think strategically about it. Yeah, very cool. Great. So I feel like we covered so much by now. So I feel like it's a great time for us to have a quick summary of the webinar's main takeaways. Um, so we know by now that AI is thriving in the retail and also in the e-commerce industries, but we need also to remember that cool is not enough. And this is why it's super important having testings and establishing clear ROI. Um, we also discussed different ways to really tackle assortment ch challenges, as Avi mentioned, both on the front end and also on the back end side. 
And lastly, we also saw how visual AI can really streamline the assort assortment planning uh, by revealing deeper insights into sales trends, as Likala just showed us, and also leading to optimized inventory investments. Um, so I think that we still have a few minutes left uh, for questions. So let's take a look at the questions that we have coming in from the audience. Really good ones, actually, Raz. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So question number number one: How much how much past data does the AI need to make to make informed decisions on futures buy? So it's more accurate when you start. Mm. Totally. The more, the better, obviously. But if you think about a statistically relevant data set, thirty data points of anything is useful enough to draw conclusions. So that's where we begin. Um, so, you know, if, if an item has been allocated to a particular store in the amount of 30 units, or it's been selling for up to 30 weeks, those are how we kind of combine enough data to say this is a relevant statistic to use, or if it's too little, then we don't use those. So I think there's really, um, it's all about how much data you have, but it can start from as little as uh, 30 points. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question on a deeper dive on sales mix, can you, or how do you differentiate what is the full price versus what is the markdown that makes up those sales mix numbers for the, wow, that's a long question, for the top line sales demand, as well as retail sales price buckets you referenced? Oh, this person knows their stuff. I love it. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Like you do not want to analyze demand on markdown. Definitely not. So you use your filter, show me sales at full price only so that I can see the demand when the product was at full price um, and then analyze that because we definitely don't want to be buying for discounting. It's funny because uh, we see that also on the front end, right? When you're showing the product recommendations and I'm yeah. standing on a PDP um, of a markdown item, do I want to show other full, full price items, even though there might be similar items or they might be relevant to me? Um, and, and that's where our customers are starting to kind of use additional kind of merchandising rules um, to say, okay, if someone's shopping a sale, let's show them a sale. But if they're shopping a full price item, I do want to show them. Yeah, nice. Okay, one more super interesting question that I see. How can you maintain a personal touch when using AI? I'm concerned about your experiences feeling robotic to our customers. Personal touch, Avi. How do you do yeah. that? So, so I think from our side, um, there's a lot of ways to actually do that. It all starts with kind of the lexicon. Uh, the way that we work with our customers uh, starts with mapping out the lexicon. So just uh, so if you can call something leopard skin, I will call it leopard print. Um, but but even kind of going a bit deeper into um, how are you defining each one of those uh, attributes. And, and how are we adding kind of or, or matching the AI to the jargon of the client? And then the other side is always kind of trying to find that mix. And, and you know, it, it's, I, I think the sentence of, of the year is it's all about the prompt. Um, but, but, but to find that mix and find the right tone of voice um, and find the right uh, length to really kind of try to keep that as personal as possible. Uh, but but from my point of view, it really kind of starts with that lexicon piece. Yeah, totally. Um, I just translated this next question, Liraz. Oh, okay. It's a good one. Um, what is the key to an efficient assortment and how to calculate the quantity to send to each store? So this is a great question because every store will sell a different number of units, right? And you need to know what to send to each store. It's all based on how many units can that store sell when they're in stock, um, obviously within the life cycle of that product as well. So some stores can sell 100 units per week in the same style as another will store will sell, say, two units a week. So when you understand at the top line store level, how many units a week of an average product can I sell? It gives you an exact kind of quantification of like, this is my average buy for this um, store in this kind of category. And then you can break it down even further and say, look, if I'm buying a Chelsea boot for a particular store, can that store sell more than one unit of Chelsea boots per week? Um, and you break it down that way. So you can go all the way up from 
product size level all the way through to um, store channel and assess total demand uh, by store by week. Great. Uh, all right. So I feel like we answered most of the main questions and some great answers. And I think we're just about out of time. Uh, so we can wrap things up. Uh, so Michaela, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today. And thank you everyone who joined us for this enlightening conversation. Uh, we will also be sharing a recording of the webinar right afterwards. So you can uh, take a look uh, later on. And wishing you all successful assortment planning. And bye for now. Thank you, Lira. See you guys. Thank Thanks you. So much. Thank you, Rad. Thanks, Thanks again.